The Hudson Institute's Nina Shea joins us with an update on the persecution of Christians in Nigeria. And the assault on the celebration of the traditional Latin Mass continues here in the United States in a major archdiocese. President of the Acton Institute, Father Robert Sirico, is here with analysis, and he shares his new book, the economics of the parables. Finally, we remember the life and legacy of peace activist and poet, Maddie Stepanek. The World Over begins right now. Now, Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. We have an important show for you tonight. If you'd like to comment, send me a tweet. I'm at Raymond Arroyo. Lots to cover this evening. But first, some news, sad news. Two elderly Jesuit priests were murdered by gunmen in a church in northern Mexico this week. Father Javier Campos Morales, 79, and Father Joaquin Salazar, 80, were killed after a man fleeing drug dealers took refuge inside a church. The drug gang followed the man into the church, executing him along with the two priests. The killers then left, taking all three bodies with them. The Society of Jesus in Mexico issued a statement demanding justice and the return of the priest's bodies for burial. Pope Francis lamented the killings, saying, quote, so many murders in Mexico, I am close in affection and prayer to the Catholic community affected by this tragedy. Approximately 30 priests have been murdered in Mexico over the past decade. Mm. On Wednesday, June 22nd, an 18th annual memorial mass was held for the late peace activist and poet Manny Stepanek. The liturgy was held at St. Rose of Lima Parish in Gaithersburg, Maryland, in celebration of Maddie's life and ongoing legacy. Maddie's mom, Dr. Jenny Stepanek, offered these thoughts on her beloved son's life. In many ways, Maddie was a typical child and teen, and yet I am in awe of his relationship with the Trinity and his clarity of purpose in life. I am in awe of his reliance on the gifts of the Spirit to strengthen and rejuvenate him as he coped with challenges and also celebrated the gifts of life within, with others, and with our world. We will have much more on Maddie Stepanek a little later in the show. What a boy. Uh, according to Open Doors, one in six Christians in Africa suffers some kind of persecution for their faith. Nigeria has been hit particularly hard with religious persecution of Christians. Some, including my next guest, are calling it a religious cleansing. Right now in Nigeria, millions of Christians are being targeted for merely practicing their faith, and some are blaming it all on climate change. Joining me now to explain is the director of the Center for Religious Freedom at the Hudson Institute, Nina Shea. Nina, you wrote a terrific piece on this situation in Nigeria for National Review this week. Um, it, it has been over two weeks since that horrible church massacre that killed 40 people. Uh, but I was perplexed, as I know you were, by the notion that climate change is to cause and the, the cause of this persecution of Christians. Even Anthony Blinken, the State Department uh, uh, secretary, seems to give credence to this. Your thoughts? It's um, really uh, just a misnomer. It's worse than that. It's a falsehood. And it's a justification for the killings, essentially, Raymond. When you think about it, mm. by saying that there's climate change, it means that people were driven to murder um, other, other religious believers from another religion uh, because the climate forced them to do that. And it's a fight over resources. So ultimately, it's a Marxian analysis. And it's completely false. It, there's no solution when you uh, mm. blame it on climate change, of course. Of course, um, you want to have police, you want to have protection, you want to have security forces, you want to have justice in those cases. You want it to stop. And um, mm -hmm. climate change offers really no short-term solution for them. 
Well, well, Nina, in this case, no suspects have been identified, though this massacre was conducted by radical Islamists. The, the witnesses provide us with that information. Uh, but it's a kind of clever scapegoat here, blaming the environment, because it serves a political end, which is we have to dump more money into climate change legislation and uh, closing down fossil fuel exploration and, and uh, expansion so we can stop the persecution over here. It also lets you off the hook of not having to investigate who's responsible for this persecution. But what is going on here? Why is there no effort to find justice for these victims, Nina? Well, I think that there's uh, very little sympathy, to say the least, for Christians. And um, they, uh, our leaders, our political leaders now, do not want to, and it's in the United States, it's in Ireland, it's in the U.K., they're all saying the same thing, that this is climate change. This is a way of making the perpetrator the victim, uh, Raymond, and the Christians mm. are just, uh, you know, don't play a role here, even though they're the ones that are being killed. In fact, more Christians killed in Nigeria in recent years, including the last year, than anywhere else in the world. Uh, so this yeah. is a serious problem. It's not a one-off event that, um, that there was a church attack on Pentecost. It's uh, been a pattern yeah. for years, and it's building, it's accelerating, and it's spreading all around the country of Nigeria. Now, that's an interesting point you raise, that this has been a problem for years. And you, look, you, you were part of the International Religious Freedom Board at the uh, State Department. Um, last fall, the State Department delisted Nigeria from its list of countries of particular concern for religious persecution. Now, this Pentecost massacre makes it look like that's a rather poor decision on the State Department's part. Your thoughts? Yes, it's political. It's part of the narrative that you outlined, Raymond, that it's, um, it fits into climate change, it fits into intersectionality. Uh, um, we don't want to blame uh, victims for religiously mm. motivated attacks coming from radical Islamists. Um, and we don't want to uphold Christians as the victims because, um, you know, vic they're, they're co colonizers, they're uh, white racists. Even though these are black Christians we're talking about, um, and and delisting was a way to uh, just put put the whole issue aside that more Christians are being killed now in Nigeria than any other place in the world, and they're being brutally murdered. And of course, you know, Raymond, this is happening in a larger context of anarchy in Nigeria. But that often happens. It happened with the yeah. Jewish Holocaust. There was a war going on. Mm -hmm. But still, you can focus and single out the, a particular victim group for religiously motivated violence. You know, it's curious, Nina. Uh, it's not only the United States government throwing around this notion of climate change as cause of these violent religious persecutions and attacks. Irish President Michael Higgins excused the murders by jihadis, saying these Fulani herdsmen are, quote, pastoral peoples who are among the foremost victims of the consequences of mm -hmm. climate change. Now, Nina. The local bishop of Nigeria denounced the Irish president's statement. He said uh, these atrocities are religious cleansing of Christians. Explain. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it started in the northeast of Nigeria with terror groups that are affiliated with ISIS, and we all know about ISIS. Um, mm -hmm. And they wanted to eradicate Christians in Iraq and Syria, and and they're doing it now. In um, the, the, these are uh, locals who are affiliated with ISIS of the Middle East, and they're doing the same thing in Nigeria, and it's uh, spreading around the, the 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 actually West Africa and the rest of Nigeria. The the church that was attacked on Pentecost Sunday, filled with worshipers, um, was actually a peaceful area. There wasn't any history of this. So it's a sign that this is spreading, and it's extremely dangerous because there are, are we have national interests in maintaining uh, peace in the region and, and partnership and trade with Nigeria. Nina, why is there such a pronounced bias uh, in favor of the Fulani, these herdsmen, particularly those who are radicalized jihadis? Well, it is playing with fire, and um, the president of Nigeria is the son of a Fulani chieftain. His name is Buhari, 
And um, mm. he has been putting out this narrative that these are pastoralists, these are these Fulani herdsmen have not been radicalized, mm. they are not jihadis, that's not who's doing this, this is just ordinary crime. And yet you see it over and over again, the same pattern, not only attacking a single church, but attacking an entire village or a farming region. The churches are always burned. The uh, people are killed. The priests are yeah. taken as kidnap victims. So it's, it's a pattern that's been growing, and it's extremely dangerous for our interests as well as theirs. The, the, the Fulani conducting these attacks, Nina, on Christian farms in the north, they seem to be well organized. Who's funding them? Do we know? Well, some of it is funded by um, crime, and uh, they have made common cause with some of the cartels in the region, criminal cartels. Um, but, but there are mm -hmm. also um, there's, uh, Islamist governments in the Gulf and individuals um, who are also funding this. Uh, so yeah. it's, um, it's, it's kind of murky, but there's, you know, very little um, uh, interest in tracking that down. Hmm. Uh, are the Fulani behind these attacks, uh, other attacks in Nigeria, in addition to the Pentecost massacre? I mean, just days after funerals were held for the massacre victims, two more churches were attacked. Mm -hmm. And are they only ta targeting Catholics here or other denominations? being uh, yeah. assaulted as well. I don't think there's a week that goes by there isn't a church or a village attacked in northern Nigeria, across the north. And Kaduna mm -hmm. State has been one of the hardest hit. And there have been several uh, entire villages attacked. They can even be occupied by the Fulani um, radicals. And their names changed, mm -hmm. and the government still doesn't respond. There's total impunity for them. So this continues, and it, um, it, it, it is accelerating. Uh, there was another um, incident that's, that, that should have been front page headlines. The, um, the prelate, the head of the Methodist Church of Nigeria, was captured um, by, he thinks, Fulani. He says Fulani um, and, and his bishop and uh, a chaplain. And they were taken into the bush. They were tortured. And then they were, um, th they put a, uh, they demanded um, 100 million Nigerian uh, money and uh, mounting to a quarter of a million dollars, which they ended up paying. Um, be, their attackers and their, their uh, kidnappers because they put a gun to the bishop's head and threatened to um, uh, pull the trigger in front of the prelate. Um, so they were released. Mm. The prelate came out and gave a press conference about this. And, and it's rarely talked about. And he talked about how much money they <laughs> had to give to, to spare their lives. And um, how the Fulani told them, their captives told them that this land belongs to the Fulani. We're coming after all of you. So um, there's very little doubt what their agenda is. Whether it's organized or not, we don't know because no one can investigate it. No, the government refuses, the government of Nigeria refuses to investigate yeah. because they are also uh, um, dominated by the Fulani. Well, and, and the United States and these international bodies have no interest in getting involved because mm -hmm. they, they, they have other interests that they're, they're worried about now. Nina, Christians make up half of Nigeria's 216 mm -hmm. million people. Mm -hmm. Now, President Buhari was elected the president of Nigeria on the promise to end corruption and secure the country. Mm -hmm. So how and why is the Buhari government allowing fully half of its population to be terrorized? Well, I think that they want to maintain power, and this is the way they plan to do it. Um, they. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they uh, represent the Fulani and, and no other northern Muslim tribes, and they want to uh, make all of Nigeria that way. Um, they, part of their, the plan, I think, it must be to see millions of Christians displaced and impoverished and left without hope, which is exactly what has happened so far, especially in the north, um, and it's coming south yeah. now. No, Nina, it's so galling. You see what's happening here, Angola, um, other parts of Africa. And the United States, you know, we're, we're, we're now poised to throw 450 million more dollars on top of the billions we've sent to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And yet there's no attention at all to the human suffering, the religious persecution, and, and a, a massive shift in the civil society of these African countries. None at all. 
They're, they're just totally looking the other way. On a positive note, I mean, we've got to find something positive. Two Nigerian schoolgirls who were kidnapped by Boko Haram eight years ago were freed this week. Both women carried babies with them, so they were obviously taken advantage of in captivity. What can you tell us about their recovery? And is this a sign of hope that others will be found or released? Well, we shouldn't stop trying. And I think of Leah Shariba, who's been there for about a decade, I think, at this point, um, mm -hmm. uh, or maybe a little less. But uh, we shouldn't stop trying. It is a sign of hope. Uh, it is a long recovery. I, you know, talked to a priest who, who does trauma rehabilitation of these girls. And he said it's uh, very hard for them, as you can imagine. Bas basically, they've lived mm. through serial rape and intimidation and death threats every single day. And um, they are not sometimes well accepted back in their, in their country, in their homes and neighborhoods, because th there's a fear that they may right. have been radicalized and be, um, you know, helping the, the, the husband, or quote, unquote, um, back yeah. in, in hiding. Wow. Well, we will leave it there. Nina Shea, as thank always, you. thank you for your insight, your reporting on the persecution of Christians that really uh, no one gives it the attention it deserves. I thank you for your work. Thank you, Raymond. Pope Francis's restrictions on the celebration of the traditional Latin Mass have been working their way through dioceses all over the world, including here in the U.S. With analysis of that and much more as president of the Acton Institute and author of the new book, The Economics of the Parables, Father Robert Sirico. And I should mention today is Father's birthday. Father Robert, happy uh, birthday. Thanks for being here and sharing it with thank us. Thank you. Uh, thank you very before much. Before we get to the book, I want to begin with a Father's Day reflection given this past weekend in Chicago's old St. Patrick's Church. Now, instead of a homily following the gospel, the celebrant invited two men to offer a Father's Day gospel reflection. Listen. And of course, today is Father's Day, and conveniently, we tick both of those boxes. Let us be honest, there are probably not too many gay dads speaking on Father's Day at many Catholic churches on the planet today. They went on to describe the miracles of their marriage and the adoption of daughters. Content aside, Father, how does this square with canon law? It states very clearly that a homily should be reserved for a priest or a deacon. That's true. Uh, there's only uh, an exceptional circumstance that the priest is unable to preach. Uh, but uh, so just just on the basis of lay people giving a homily, but usually when this is done, the priest will kind of cover by saying, well, it wasn't the homily, it was a reflection. But um, mm. uh, we know it, if it walks like a duck, that's what it is. Mm. Is this illicit? No, no, very clearly, according to the canons, it's not licit. I wonder if uh, mm -hmm. the archdiocese has made any statement clarifying this or if the None priest himself has uh, offered a justification. Let me uh, share this with you. The Catholic Church also does not recognize same-sex unions. And in 2006, the U.S. Bishops Conference explained that it doesn't support the adoption of children by same-sex couples. So what do you think is going on here in Chicago? <laughs> What do you think is going on in Chicago? It's very clear what's going on in Chicago, at least in this parish, that uh, they are pushing the bounds. I mean, it's interesting that in that comment that the gentleman made uh, about being Pride Day and Father's Day and all the rest of it, mm -hmm. he said, uh, this is not going on in many Catholic churches. Well, why? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because it's contrary to the teaching of the church and her liturgical norms. Mm. Chicago's Cardinal Blaise Supich announced a comprehensive liturgical policy after the Congregation of Divine Worship, the Vatican's liturgical office, issued instructions on the extraordinary form of the Mass last December. Now, following Pope Francis's apostolic letter, Tradiciones Custodes, Supich banned the celebration of Mass in the Ad Orientum posture, that's facing east, or so-called away from the people, without permission. Priests who are Get, who received the permission to celebrate the extraordinary form of the Mass, must also celebrate the new Mass, one Sunday a month, as well as Christmas and the Tridium and Pentecost, and the readings, of course, have to be in the vernacular. In his letter announcing the new norms, Supich told Chicago priests to, quote, 
faithfully adhere to the liturgical norms so that as the body of Christ, our worship of God may always enrich and never diminish the faith of our people. Is this adhering to liturgical norms, Father? When you allow lay people up in the, in the uh, lectern to offer homilies, uh, I mean, it seems to me instead of banning Latin Mass, where the rubrics are pretty fastidiously observed, what about cleaning up these uh, aberrations in the new Mass? No, I think you're very right to point out this contradiction, and it, it's really self immolating. That if you're going to try and impose a set of liturgical norms against traditional forms of worship, but not impose the set of norms, in other words, you're destroying norms altogether, and you're just a will to power here. What you want to do, what you feel you want to do to respond to a, a particular political current or a, a season. And it's really making a hash of the whole uh, liturgical sensibility of the church, which is important mm -hmm. not just for its style, but for its prayer and theology. Remember that lex orandi, lex credendi, we pray as we believe, belief informs. Uh, our prayer. And what's happening here is a complete confusion and chaos in the whole matter. So it, it collapses uh, any kind of expectation of uh, fulfilling the norms of the church. And if that happens, uh, it can cut any which way. According to reports, Father, I want to move because this is an interesting area. And, and again, um, the church teaches one thing, but as you said, we, we worship as we believe. Well, then that worship has to be uh, adhered to the beliefs of the church. There are reports a right. church in Bologna has staged the first public blessing of a gay couple in Italy. Uh, a diocesan communique denies the claim, saying it was a mass of thanksgiving for a group called In Camino, On the Way, which aims to accompany and offer support uh, in the Christian life for people with homosexual tendencies. However, Photos of the two men standing in the front of the altar wearing boutonnieres and suits and later having rice thrown on them outdoor the church suggest otherwise. The Diocese of Bologna, incidentally, is headed by Archbishop Matteo Maria Zuppi. He is the newly appointed president of the Italian Bishops' Conference. Now, Zuppi was apparently aware of this Mass of Thanksgiving, according to the pastor, on June 11th. Your thoughts on your, what do you make of this blessing taking place in Zuppi's archdiocese? Well, I mean, it's obvious, the same thing that we said in, in the Chicago context. But here's the really frustrating thing about this, is it's not being honest. It's being disingenuous. If you want to dissent from the church's teachings, say it. Say exactly what you believe and what you don't believe, and then let the consequences fall. Uh, but what's happening here is this duplicity, and it, it really bespeaks a lack of authenticity uh, in the name of authenticity. Uh, it lacks uh, a clarity. Um, it, it, you know, and, and let's remember that uh, heresy is truth gone mad, the old saying goes. So that there's a truth in the middle of all of this, and it's what the Catechism says about people of same-sex orientation being treated with dignity and with respect. No unjust discrimination, the Catechism says. And that is just. But what they are doing here is undermining the very authority of the Catechism that calls for the proper treatment of people with same-sex orientation. Hmm. In 2021, following on that, uh, the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith confirm that same-sex blessings by Catholic priests are not licit. Uh, now, they're claiming in Bologna this is a mass of thanksgiving to get around that rule. Uh, are, do you expect to see more of this? Well, we're seeing it. That's exactly the kind of argument that's being used in Chicago. This isn't a homily. Uh, this, we're not saying anything about homosexual actions. You know, it's again, it's duplicitous. And if these uh, incidences are not uh, stopped in one way or another if the uh, authorities, uh, like uh, Cardinal Zuppi uh, or Cardinal Supic, uh, don't put some censure on the priests who are behaving this way, of course we're going to see more and more of this kind of thing. And then what happens when more traditional people want to ignore 
the cardinal in in terms of the way and the style of their liturgies. I mean, it, it, again, it gets down to chaos. Let's remember that the name of uh, another name for the devil is the dissembler, the one who breaks things apart. Mm. It lies. Yep. And uh, let's just be honest about this. You you claim to want authenticity. You claim to want truth. Then let's just have an honest discussion about these things. Yeah. The Vatican has issued a new collection of commemorative coins, Father. Um, a new one. It's a 20-euro piece. It has a depiction of a young person receiving a vaccine. Uh, the description on the Vatican website states that the 20-euro coin is dedicated to the current theme that's very close to Pope Francis's heart. The Holy Father has repeatedly stressed the importance of vaccination, recalling that health care is a moral obligation and it is important to continue efforts to immunize even the poorest of people, end quote. Your thoughts on this coin and the timing of the release? Well, what strikes me is how trendy this all is. Uh, it's coming at a time where, uh, pray God, this this whole pandemic and shutdowns are is subsiding, uh, and it's holding up a, a kind of trendy. There's a, a, a kind of virtual signaling that's been going on during the whole thing, both with the masks and and with the uh, the whole vaccine. Uh, uh, debates that, that have taken place where mm -hmm. the church says that it has always given us the option with regard to vaccines. It's not mandatory in our Catholic mm -hmm. faith. So it's a stylistic thing. It's a trend. They're putting it on a coin. So maybe there's, uh, you know, I can't wait to see the next coin. I mean, maybe we'll have, uh, you know, oral health care and toothbrush uh, uh, <laughs> virtue. Well, if you, I, I worry if you turn that vaccine coin over, it might be sponsored by Pfizer, but we'll take a close look but to they, make sure oh, that that's the case. That would be a great uh, marketing idea. Yeah, well, at least somebody would pay for this thing. Uh, I want to talk sure. for a moment about your new book, The Economics of the Parables. Uh, you have mined yes. the parables here for economic wisdom that often goes unseen or unnoticed. Why? Well, because what Jesus is doing, and he does it not just with these things that have economic dimensions, but in all of life, he's teaching us something about eternity from the context of scarcity, of the real world, of the earth. And uh, these 13 parables that I've chosen, there could be more that I could have written on, really give us examples and, and bespeak the uh, knowledge that our Lord has of the reality of scarcity and the necessity of uh, allocating resources properly in a way that serves the the human community. And you see this and yeah. repeat, I mean, the parable of the talents is one great example. We don't have the time to go through through all of them. But if you think about it uh, for a moment, you can you can see that things like trade, wage rates, uh, uh, inheritance disputes, uh, discovery of valuable things that were hidden or not discovered before. Uh, all of these things are in these Gospels. And what I try to do is uncover the, the kind of consequences uh, uh, of this kind of thinking. It's, it, it, it really, I think, will be surprising. I think there's some new things in there that people would not have thought of. Much of Catholic social teaching, Father, condemns socialism and Marxism. However, we have seen various elements of capitalism condemned by the current pontificate. Even Pope Benedict and John Paul were dubious of certain parts of market capitalism. Um, Pope Francis said capitalism failed during the pandemic of 2020. The Pope has repeatedly rejected trickle-down economics in his encyclical uh, Brothers All and the 2013 Evangelium Gaudium. What do you make of the Pope's statements on the evils of capitalism and condemnations of trickle-down economics? Well, um of course, there are things in capitalism that uh, can be condemned that I would join in condemning. Uh, somebody once said that the socialism condemns, so, uh, I'm sorry, the church condemns socialism at its root, but only condemns capitalism in its branches. And there are things that are on the market that are immoral, that should be condemned, that even should be outlawed. But that is not uh, because. In other parts of uh, Fratelli Tutti, for example, the Holy Father says that business people with an ethical uh, orientation, with a primacy of uh, human dignity uh, and under law, can be uh, 
indispensable in benefiting the poor. And that's the capitalism or the free market that we want to defend. I think that it's unfair and it reveals a kind of inconsistent way of thinking and a, a lack of depth of economic understanding. In the book, you write about the story of the rich man encountering Jesus and asking him what it will take to enter the kingdom of heaven and how this is often misinterpreted. You write, here is where the famous phrase so often recounted in discussions about wealth and economic success arises. How hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. That vivid metaphor which comes midway through the account, is perhaps its most memorable part. Jesus' words are often seen as a denunciation of wealth or an indication that wealth is incompatible with discipleship. What is it that people get so wrong about this moment in Jesus' life and this encounter? The important thing that people are missing right here is the first thing that Jesus says to the rich man. He invites him to come and be his disciple. We could have had 13 apostles had he accepted the Lord's invitation. But what is the first thing that he says? I'm going to give everybody a moment to think about that. And they're going to think, I'll bet the majority will say, <laughs> well, Jesus told him to give away everything. But that's not the first thing he tells him. The first mm. thing he says is go and sell all that you have. In other words, he's in admonishing him to first engage in commerce. Now, think about that for a moment. If yeah. there is a connection between this man's wealth and the distribution to the needy and the poor, and our Lord tells him to sell it, then wouldn't you think that the Lord expects the man to get a good price on, on the things that yeah. he's selling? In other words, he's engaging in commerce, and it shows the connection between his successful entrepreneurship, his marketing, and his service of the poor. And that, to me, is a metaphor mm. for the market as a whole. I'm not saying that Jesus is trying to teach us economics here, but what I'm trying to say is that it does not indicate that our Lord is prejudiced against people who have wealth. He wants them to prioritize. The, the, the scriptures you just read, it says, those who put their trust in wealth. Mm. We cannot put yeah. our trust in wealth. How does this whole story end? It ends with Jesus answering the disciples' question when they say, well, then who can get into heaven? If the rich can't right. get into heaven, who can get into heaven? And he says, what? With man, all things. With man, it is impossible. With God, all things are all possible. Things. Mm. Yeah. No, it's, 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 it's a, and our it's Lord a had very rich and, friends, uh, too. Insight. Yeah, well, that's uh, true. No, he did, rich in, friends, in a circle. Joe, Yes, he, he went to the cross with with a, a, a civil row suit, in effect. He the, the seamless garment was a very valuable garment. And our Lord goes, so where did he get that? He got that maybe from Joseph of Arimathea. What do you want people to learn from the book and from these parables that are often misinterpreted or misunderstood? A parable means something that is side by side. Jesus is saying the kingdom of heaven is like... And what I want people to learn is where we are right now in our world of scarcity can indicate to us something transcendent, something that has no scarcity, the eternal kingdom of heaven. It's not how to buy and trade and make money. It's how to get to heaven. And that's by the grace of God. Before we go, I have to ask you about the Acton Institute's Jimmy Lai documentary. We've covered uh, yes. Jimmy Lai's uh, terrible journey here. Uh, it, it, he was yeah. arrested for his Very sad. speaking out and, and wanting to protect democracy in Hong Kong. The documentary is called The Hong Konger. How is it being received? How can people see it? There are private showings right now because we're going through a series of film festivals before we uh, hopefully it'll be picked up by one of the streaming services or some other um, company. Um, it is being really very well received. The people who came out of the showings here uh, at the Acton University uh, were crying. Uh, they were deeply moved by it, mm. and we have some of the people who were arrested, who are threatened to be arrested, Chinese people from Hong Kong. Uh, it's being very, very well received, and uh, I, I think it's a very powerful statement. People can go online to the Hong Konger and see a video clip of it, uh, and then uh, wait for us to come to a uh, town near you, and or wait for it to be streamed on Netflix or one of the other services. Okay. Have you heard from Jimmy or any of his family members about his welfare? How is he, how is he doing? 
Yes, uh, he's doing fine as, I mean, as fine as you can be in a prison cell. But let me right. tell you what he's doing is he is reading. He has asked for reading lists of uh, things that will deepen his spirituality. I mean, when a person is in this circumstance, like Cardinal Pell, like uh, uh, Cardinal Xavier Nguyen Van Thuan, uh, and a whole yeah. history of saints who have been in this, when they deepen their relationship with Christ, it fortifies them to give this effective witness, which is exactly what Jimmy Lai is doing now at mm. this moment. Excellent. Well, I can't wait to see the whole thing. Find out more about the Acton documentary, The Hong Konger, Jimmy Lai's Extraordinary Struggle for Freedom. It's at thehongkongermovie.com. And The Economics of the Parables, the latest book from Father Robert Sirico, is available now at bookstores and online at theacton.com org website. Thank you, Father. God bless. As I mentioned earlier, peace activist and poet Matty Stepanek was remembered this week at a memorial mass in his home parish in Maryland. It has been 18 years since Matty left us, but his message of peace remains as vital and relevant today as ever. I sat down with his mother, Dr. Jenny Stepanek, in 2018 to talk about her son and his message. Jenny, Maddie would have been 28 years old this July 17th. Uh, it's a big day, which we're going to talk about in a minute. What do you want people to know about he and his message all these years later? I would say that his message is as valid, as necessary, and as real today as it was when he was sharing it. Um, hope is real, and peace is possible, and life is worthy. And I think the more we learn in our world, the more we grow forward, the more um, things like social media connect us, the more important it becomes for us to understand the importance of peace and our personal choices in what we say, in what we do, um, and how we interact with people. Um, and, and I think that's really where we are now, is, is bringing peace up to date and making it relevant to youth and adults today. Mm -hmm. I am always amazed um, just seeing you looking so great, so engaged, so vibrant. Uh, people wouldn't know that since we last saw you on the show, uh, you've been diagnosed with an aggressive form of cancer. You're battling neuromuscular disease. What of Maddie's message or words have inspired you to go on to continue this celebration and battle? Um. When I was going through chemotherapy a couple of years ago, I actually would blog every week and I would find something that Maddie wrote and create an entire blog based on that uh, because Maddie inspired me to believe that hope is real. Hope is not a magical cure, it's not a fix, it's not a miracle that's going to heal you, but hope um, anchored in faith anchored in finding some reason to be grateful um, or even a source of service for someone else, even in moments of suffering, that, that that can get you into some next moment, can help you deal with even the worst pain. Um, so Maddie inspired me to really root myself in hope, um, not an illusion, um, but in the hope that somebody beats the odds in the hope that even with progressive diagnoses that I have purpose and that that purpose can be to serve God and to serve others and to be a source of hope and peace for our world just as Maddie was. One of the things I loved about Maddie's message, more importantly Maddie's example and yours, is that despite the challenges you were dealing with or that he was dealing with, you're focused really on the other people and on others. And uh, tell the story of the day that the Oklahoma City bombing happened. He's what, four years old? He was four years old. It was in April of 1995. And he had been watching something on TV and it went off and the news came on and it was about the Oklahoma bombing. Um, I quickly turned it off and tried to explain to him what had happened. But in that brief amount of time, he had already seen these devastating images um, of children and adults who died 
um, and who were going to be survivors and living with the pain. And I talked to him about praying um, for the survivors, praying for the victims. Um, and he said, that's, that's important. We can pray for the families, we can pray for them, but we need to really pray for the people who did this because they're the ones that don't have peace in their hearts. We need to pray for people to have peace so that this stops. And he was as concerned about whoever caused this violence as he was about the children and the adults and the survivors in a different way. It was a different mm -hmm. type of concern, a different type of prayer. But in, in his heart, Jesus died for sinners and he wanted the sinners to have peace in their heart and understand why this was wrong. Mm. Why no matter what you're going through, this is not the right choice to deal with whatever your reality is or whatever your anger or issue is. He also had a pretty dramatic response to 9-11. Yes. Um, Tell us what happened. Um, well, with 9-11, he watched personal friends literally go up in ash. He had been with firefighters on September 10th and those very firefighters, some of them were in the World Trade Centers on September 11th and died. Um, and on that day, um, Maddie wrote a series of poems um, and passages for peace where he initially struggled questioning, it, can we still find peace? Is there national security? Is there hope? It, it, are we ever going to really get along with each other and stop this unnecessary violence? By the end of the day, um, he wrote a poem um, called For Our World that essentially says we need to stop, be silent, and notice. And to rebuild the mosaic of humanity, stop shattering it. Um, I would say one of his biggest responses to interrupted peace was actually in 2003 when um, the United States bombed Iraq. Mm -hmm. And Maddie was in the hospital at the time. And um, we were watching some evening TV program and they interrupted. And when he realized what he was seeing was missiles and bombs falling on Iraq and he had been working so hard to create passages to inspire people to understand why war is an unnecessary evil and that there are ways to resolve our conflicts without bombs. And when he saw these bombs fall, he literally had a physiological response. It changed his heart rate, his blood pressure, his skin turned blue. Um, he was spiritually and emotionally devastated and physically compromised. And doctors and nurses were worried about him. Um, I was quite worried. Um, he really struggled with that but came back even stronger um, and committed to sharing a message of peace and sharing it in more and more ways so that people understand how peace begins. Not about pausing violence, but about how to begin peace. How to teach kindness and empathy to children. How to teach um, thoughtfulness and, and instill and nurture resilience in children and adults. So he began really breaking down the message into specific elements of hope and peace so that people could better understand. You mentioned empathy, and he had it in amazing ways. I mean, even when he was struggling with imminent death, choking on his trachea, battling in and out of really, he crossed over to the other side and came back a few times. Tell me about that, the empathy you saw there in the hospital, in the hospital room. In the hospital room. I had seen empathy in Maddie from the time he was literally 13 months old at a church picnic where he showed empathy for a, a toddler who was crying and, and he comforted her and, and helped her. And I saw that exact same empathy throughout his entire life and the day he died. Um, we knew he was dying. We didn't know it would be that day, but we knew he was gasping for breath. His bones were broken and he was struggling literally for every single breath. And the baby in the next bed in the ICU was crying and crying. And Maddie started calling out, nurse, 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 because uh, he could, couldn't even really speak well anymore. 
And the nurse came running in and, and said, what's wrong? Are you in pain? And he said, the baby, the baby. And she said, what's wrong? Is the, the crying bothering you? And he said, no. Um, and he said, hold the baby. The baby is the future. The baby has purpose. Comfort the baby. Comfort the baby. And that nurse started crying. Um, and she picked up the baby and, and Maddie said, sing. And so she sang to the baby. Um, and, and Maddie died within 24 hours of, of this happening. But he was so concerned about this baby knowing you matter even though you're in a hospital and you're suffering and you're in pain, but you matter, you have purpose, you are loved, you are cherished, and somebody's going to comfort you and hold you. Um, and that was within the day of his death. You have some concerns that people think of Maddie as a celebrity and that Oprah is responsible for him in well, many ways. I, I think when people hear Maddie's name, they think of him as Oprah's kid, and I think that's lovely. I think that's wonderful. And Maddie and Oprah were very close. They were sincerely friends and loved each other, and to this day she still loves him. And people think Maddie wanted to be on her show because he had poetry books. Really, his wish was that um, Maddie, Maddie said when he was six years old, okay, and he wasn't on her show until he was 11. Right. When Maddie was six years old, um, he came to me and he said, God put Oprah Winfrey and me on earth at the same time with purpose. I'm <laughs> thinking, oh, did he now? Uh, <laughs> like, really? Course, yeah. Um, because he'd read a little biography of her. That he, he, he'd that read he, a little book about bought. her, and it was like an aha moment for him. Like, mm -hmm. this is the person that's going to sh amplify my purpose. He said, God gave me a purpose of shaping a message of hope and peace so that people can understand what God wants them to understand. He said, I shape it for children, for adults. I shape it for Christians, for non-Christians. He said, I shape hope and peace into something that people understand how they can be a source of hope and peace, even in hopeless moments, even in moments of suffering, even when there's war and trauma. Um, but he said, what I need is to get this message out to the world, because otherwise I've got this message. I've done what God's asked me to do. I have been a messenger, I've shaped it, but then it just sits in my computer. And he saw Oprah as the vehicle of that heart song, And, that and so he saw that people turn to Oprah for inspiration. Mm -hmm. And when he saw that Oprah Winfrey was a person that knew what it was like to suffer, she was not born rich. She knew what it was like to suffer and rise up out of the ashes. So he believed that she would understand the message and he wanted her to share the message that he had shaped. It was a bonus that he, she had him on the show, and it was an unusual situation that she realized he was real. Mm -hmm. He was not a poet kid. He was not a child whose mother wanted him to be on Oprah. Mm -hmm. He was really a messenger of hope and peace. And that's why they became friends. That's why he was on her show multiple times, not because he was a cute celebrity kid, no. but because he was an authentic bearer of a message of hope and peace. Jerry Lewis also had him on as his MDA spokesman for a number of years. He was often on the telethon. I want to show people a little clip of that. You let them know what life is about because of your presence and your courage. Life is a gift, true. It's hard and it's not always the easiest thing. But if it wasn't, you know what? The challenges in life are a part of our life and that's how we learn. And some of us are meant to have a disease and some of us, like you, are meant to help fight it. All of us have a reason. And we have to choose to always live our lives to the fullest. No one is better or worse than anyone else. We are different and beautiful. And I think that is an important and powerful message. People look at children with disabilities and see them as less than perfect. They see children with developmental disabilities as children that need fixing, that need help. The help that all children need, with or without disabilities, medical, physical, spiritual, or cognitive, the help they need is to become their best self, 
to realize their purpose and their gifts from God and celebrate those gifts in a way that makes the world a better place, a fuller place. And so when you're, when you're born with a disability, yes, there's suffering involved, but it's not a mistake. It's, it's not that God made an oops and this child is less than another child. And Maddie understood that. And he cherished all children, all children, all people. Now I see you struggling against infirmity and time to continue this message, to spread it. What is that heart song that you want people to hear, both Maddie's and yours? Well, I'll begin with mine. Mine is simply that you matter, and each moment matters. And we can't control whether a moment is going to be one with suffering or one worthy of celebration. All we can have a choice in is what we do with that moment and with the next moment, how we move through it. All we can do is choose to be kind, choose to reflect God's presence in any moment, choose to, of course we all hope for another moment. I have prayed to overcome the odds. I, I've prayed for more time. Um, I've been told several times for different reasons in the last three years that my time is up. Um, and yes, I'm human. I pray for more time. Um, I am looking forward to being with my children again. I, I do hope that I see the face of God. But life is so worthy, even amid suffering, that if I can find a way to be a source of hope for someone else, and I learned this from Maddie, all right. Maddie's heart song was to, to be a source of hope and peace for other people so that it becomes real. If they don't believe it's real, be real for them. And that was why Oprah loved him. He was real. And I've learned that as well, is that if I can be helpful to you, hope for you, if I can bring you a moment of peace, then I'm reflecting God's presence on earth even amid challenges and that makes life worthy for me and for you. You matter. Every moment matters. You can learn more about Maddie's work on behalf of World Peace as well as the progress of his cause for sainthood. It's at maddiematters.org. Family Theater Productions is celebrating 75 years of award-winning media that's engaged families since the 1940s. How has it survived, and what's the future of faith-based programming? Joining me now to discuss all of this, National Director of the Family Theater Productions, Father David Guffey. Father, thanks for being here. Um, now, the, the, the organization was founded by the great Father Patrick Payton in the 1940s, and it started on radio. Why and how did he decide to start Family Theater Productions? As a young priest, Father Payton uh, had a passion for promoting family prayer, especially the rosary. And he tried a couple things locally where he was assigned in Albany, but he discovered that mass media was the way to get into people's hearts and homes, and radio was the mass media of the day. So he started doing local radio. He got the bug to do national radio, and he, so he went to Hollywood. And he went to Hollywood in October 1946. By February of 1947, he founded Family Theater, and he had a national radio mm -hmm. show on the second largest network of the time, the Mutual Broadcasting System. Mm. There have been a great many famous people who have become part of Family Theater Productions over the years. I want to give the audience a little sampling of some of those stars who contributed so much to your productions. Good evening. This is Jimmy Stewart. You know, since this is our first program, maybe we ought to have a dedication. So right now, let's dedicate the family theater to your family. was a cool look at your, your venerable past. How do you continue to appeal to audiences today? And where's the majority of your content these days, Father? I think today 
we've seen that there are audiences for faith-based and family content. Uh, that's even the industry has discovered that through the kinds of films that are being created. And our shows go, some go directly to Catholic media, but many of our shows are marketed through mainstream channels, at least initially, uh, because the mainstream world knows there's people hungry for uplifting stories that celebrate family and that include faith. Mm. What's been the biggest challenge at family theater productions to remain relevant, especially in the past decade, with so much more media to choose from? The, the great challenge is uh, there's so much content being created, it's to find a way to get the projects that we create in front of the people that would be interested in it. So the, a lot of effort mm -hmm. goes into marketing and social media marketing so people find the things that they would like to see. Yeah. How important is it to have the, a Catholic media presence in Hollywood? You know, I remember before you took over, uh, my pal father, Willie Raymond, uh, mm -hmm. you know, having seminars and opening the doors to the folks working in Hollywood. We still do that. We had a meeting last night at our first in-person meeting uh, after COVID. We still gather people wow. in the industry. Look, the church has always been involved in the arts. And in most arts, they were the leaders. Somehow we got a little bit behind in film and a little bit behind in television. Uh, but it's so important for the, the church to be there. It's so important that EWTN is, on the, is in the uh, cable, select, uh, cable networks that we can select from. It's important that we're seen and that we're part of the discussion of what gets created for culture. And in a very modest way, Family Theater tries to be that here in Hollywood today. Hmm. With, with the, we're seeing a resurgence, it seems. You mentioned faith-based programming earlier. With the Chosen series and uh, more recently with Father Stu, uh, where do you see the future of faith-based content going? I think it's going to continue to thrive. Uh, if you look at what's happened in the industry, there's a number of networks, a number of uh, mainstream studios that have founded faith-based divisions. They're looking for content. And they, they've all got things in development. So it may be a couple of years before we see it through the pike. But there's really quite a lot of faith-based content that's being produced. Again, marketing and distribution is the great challenge for all of us who create um, film, especially. Mm -hmm. What's next for Family Theater Productions, Father? We're really excited about We have a couple of things out there already. We, Of course, our film, Pray, the story of Patrick Payton, is still out there. But we, um, we have a couple of holiday films that we're about to go into production with. We've got, we've optioned and cr we're creating scripts for an animated children's series. We've got a couple books. We've got a couple things early on in development, a Bible drama, uh, a romantic comedy um, based on a documentary that we did. So we've got quite a number of projects. As you know, it takes two to 10 years to get a, a film made. And we've got a com some that are uh, films in all stages of the process right now. Wow, amazing. Father, thank you so much for being here. For more on the work and history of Family Theater Productions, you can visit familytheater.org. Father, thank you so much. Thank you. That's all the time we have for now. Be sure to catch us next week. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, I thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo. Bye now. Thank you.